We should be innovating and evidencing how pedagogy can lead to better built outcomes. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. Today I will be speaking with Neil Sashaw, the Chief Executive and Head of School at the London School of Architecture. He's also the Honorary Secretary and Trustee of the Society of Architectural Historians of Great Britain. He's a trustee of the 20th Century Society, a trustee of the Architectural Heritage Fund and an academic specialising in interwar British architecture, civic centres and public space. And he's also a world leading expert on the history and evolution of the profession. A few years ago, I had the great privilege of being able to join a architectural tour of Niels um, as he took us around some of all of the, the past buildings where the RABA used to be housed. And he gave us an incredibly detailed and fascinating account of the evolution of the architectural profession and the Reba in the UK. Neil has previously worked at the Reba. Uh, he's worked at the University of Westminster, the University of Liverpool and the University of Oxford. And he's particularly passionate about diversifying architectural education, heritage and practice. He's an architectural historian by training and his research and writing has primarily focused on architectural culture in Britain and the empire in the first half of the 20th century and this critical perspective informs his own pedagogy and practice. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with Neil. I really had my mind expanded uh, about the potentials of architectural education um, and its relationship with practice. I know this is something that constantly gets scrutinized and criticized and talked about in the architectural profession. And rightly so, it's an incredibly important facet of, you know, um, what happens when you actually run a business you know, is actually decided in this gestation period of the architect. So really, really exciting to hear Neil's perspective on it and what they're doing at the London School of Architecture. Uh, I do feel like it's a, a real, an enormous kind of revolution, if you like, in architectural education. And there's, 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 still, there's still a lot to, to, to do, um, but I really think this relationship between education and practice and the way that they're doing at the LSA is amazing. So in today's episode, we discuss all of that and we discuss possible futures of built environment education. Uh, we look at part zero and part four and how the new educational initiatives from the LSA are creating that. So you'll find out what that's all about. Uh, we talk about Neil's new book and we also look at diversity and inclusion in the profession and how business and practice education is a key part of this. So an amazing conversation here with Neil. Sit back, relax and enjoy. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Neil, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Hi, Riam. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm very well. I'm very well. Great to uh, be speaking with you. Now, you've had a, a very fascinating career. You're part historian, academic, and now educator, uh, and you're the head of the London School of Architecture. Uh, you've been incredibly committed and are, are a leader in education and kind of revitalizing and redirecting and innovating around the, the gestation period of the architect and making it much more compatible with the profession. Um, and I'm, I'm you know, a big fan of the LSA and, and what you guys have been doing in terms of apprenticeships and you know, just providing an alternative pathway to becoming an architect, which is something that so many in the profession have been looking at the universities and asking what's happening we need there needs to be a different way for architects to be to be educated so i guess my first question is what is the lsa how would you describe it uh well the lsa is a, an independent alternative 
higher education provider uh, in architecture. So um, we're a new school. We're 10 years old next year. We've just welcomed our eighth cohort of students. We offer a single program, which is the part two, uh, in our case, an MArch in designing architecture. And we have this kind of very distinct model um, of practice oriented and practice embedded architectural education. So one of our sort of founding principles is that we unite academia and practice, that we are for independent minds, not independent means. Access and affordability is absolutely at the heart uh, of what we do and what we were what we were set up to do. Uh, and we have a practice network now of over 200 practices um, operating in London from very large kind of global uh, uh, businesses to um, small one-person bands um, that ground us, that root us in practice and that participate um, in our kind of pedagogical project. So we have an earn while you learn model, which was actually in advance of the wider rollout of um, the apprenticeship model in which students study with us in the first year, i.e. fourth year of architectural studies for two days a week and are then in practice for three days a week. And then in the second year, a, a number of them carry on working one, sometimes two days a week, but are notionally with us um, full time. But the whole way that the programme is structured and the people who teach on that programme are connected to um, the kind of realities of contemporary practice. Mm. What, what would have been your criticisms of traditional architecture practice that kind of that have ha, have given rise to, for the need of something like the LSA? Of traditional architectural education? Yes, uh, yes, education. That, that, that I think um, that the intellectual discipline of architecture perhaps uh, has moved too far away from the realities of contemporary practice. What that doesn't mean is um, kind of valorizing all forms of contemporary practice and denigrating uh, academia. That's not that's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. But it's actually mobilizing the kind of um, intellectual uh, discipline, the kind of discourse, that kind of criticality, and applying it to um, contemporary practice and the questions and problems that contemporary practice um, can and should, and in many cases is addressing. So um, I think that was one of the issues. I think the other of the issues is that the majority, overwhelming majority of architecture schools within the UK system are embedded in universities and in ever larger universities with huge uh, budgets and a quite a sort of high degree of central control of costs and therefore a sense that actually you're not receiving value for money. Students are not receiving value for money because the distribution of, of, of resource um, back to the kind of people on the ground teaching um, students and collaborating with students um, was not uh, 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 as strong. That relationship was not as direct um, as it should have been. So the idea of an independent architecture school, I think, is also is also really significant and is really fundamental to our project and, and what we advocate for. When you when you talk about something like um, earn as you learn type of model, what does what does that mean? So it means that uh, you, in order to study at the LSA, uh, have to have a student placement within our practice network. So. Uh, you earn, you have a contract of employment um, with that practice that offers you the student placement, uh, which allows you to earn money whilst you uh, undertake what is a full-time programme of study. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds like such a, just my whole body goes, oh, fantastic. What a brilliant, brilliant idea. You know, often I'll get approached by um, young students who are looking to begin their architectural careers. And one of my sort of bits of advice is go and get work experience, like right at the very beginning of your architectural training. And, you know, one of the criticisms that we'll hear from practice owners about architectural education is the fact that it is, like you were saying, it's a kind of, it's, you know, we're kind of just pursuing the intellectual 
rigor of design and and design thinking as a and it's removed from the context of of reality of business i mean one thing that's always very interesting in architectural education is you won't deal with money okay we'll we'll get very skilled at being able to talk and navigate and celebrate all the other constraints of the built environment from the environmental political to you know technological physical etc but money and economics is one that we don't look at very rarely nor do we ever place design in the context of well there's a business it's a service but you know just by being in an office you will get that you will start to you will start to see that and the other criticism that we that will often hear from um from business owners is that well when an architect when a young architect or student comes out that part two we they don't they can't do a lot they don't understand how an office works they don't really know even cad they don't know planning procedures they there's there's not a lot that they can do at the beginning um and low wages and salary often reflects the fact that the architecture offices have to spend a few years um investing and training somebody before they can you know get their profit target multipliers if you like in terms of in terms of billable rates so, so this is very exciting to hear that um just that experience in practice um, yeah i mean i would i would say that because i think it's an important point and it's a perennial challenge for mm. architecture that you know architecture is a profession and professionalism you know of course we could say that the, you know, the figure of the architect has existed for centuries in one form or another and in different guises in different cultural contexts but but let's try and speak with some specificity we're, we're, we're you know we're talking in a uk context um, and I think that when I talk about the profession of architecture, I'm talking about, as it were, the invention of the modern profession of architecture uh, in the long uh, 18th century, but which came to a particular moment of maturation, uh, as it were, in the long 19th century, as part of a broader phenomenon of professionalism and professionalization. And the kind of triumph, as the great social historian Hal Perkin called it, of the professional ideal. Mm -hmm. The problem is that architecture, uh, in many senses, um, was quite reluctant, and certainly significant sections of the architectural profession were quite reluctant um, to say that architecture was a profession of, as it were, an ordinary kind or a normal kind because of this thing called design because of the art of architecture, because of the craft of architecture. And that is a big problem because therefore the intellectual discipline, discourse of architecture um, can get in the way, not perhaps the most useful phrase, but, but sure. indulge me, get in the way of you know, what, what, what we're here to talk about, what your podcast likes to talk about, which is the business of architecture. The idea that architects were businessmen, were engaged in the grubby world of commerce, was actually inimical to the professional ideal and inimical to the artistic ideal of architecture. <laughs> so the reasons for that disengagement are actually quite profound and are actually quite old and in a sense are quite important. Mm. That's fascinating. That's that's very, that's very interesting. So there's, you know, for as long as the modern architect has existed, there has always been this tension. I, I think so. And you know, if you if you if you read the kind of the history of professional debates or debates amongst the kind of professional brethren, and they were exclusively brethren um, for, for 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 much of the time about the kind of inherent problems in um, the practice and profession of architecture, they, they don't really change. You know, yeah. I think the concerns that you're advocating there are not are not, as it were, newly articulated concerns. They're old problems. So, 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 so my question is, why? Why is that problem so kind of um, endemic? Why is it so old? And I think it, it comes to the heart of what we what the modern profession uh, and practice of architecture is, and how that sits in relation to this. Um, let's be honest, kind of quite mysterious thing called design. 
However much we try to say, well, of course you can evidence good design and quality of design. You should be doing post-occupancy evaluation. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. It is elusive, often subjective, and often therefore subject to the vagaries of, for instance, taste. Yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, 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 the business of architecture, as you, as you well know, is, 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 is is but a part of the wider business of construction itself, but a part of the wider business of development. Hmm. Absolutely. So uh, in, in terms of what the LSA do, is, is doing then, what are some of the, um, the kind of mechanisms that you're using to you know, strengthen those two disciplines, if you like, or the two pathways? Well, I think the, 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 the critical, it is, it is criticality, it's critical engagement. Um, and it's praxis, uh, praxis being, I think, this kind of um, incredible space between the, the or, or kind of among the nebula of, of theory, but isn't just mere habit or custom, isn't just doing the same thing over and over again. It has a kind of inherent criticality. It's a way of thinking. It's a sort of system of knowledge. Um, or an approach to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so that is kind of woven um, very much into the course. So um, in the first year of study, for instance, alongside the kind of core design modules, students undertake uh, a module uh, uh, called critical practice. And out of critical practice comes the production of a manual, which is a sort of reflection on an element of contemporary professional practice, maybe emanating from the student placement, but maybe about kind of broader issue facing the profession and facing its kind of connected industries. Um, and then they produce a manifesto, which is the type of manifesto, uh, sorry, the type of practitioner um, that they aspire to be. So that that sort of um, critical contextual understanding informs a vision of future practice. I bet that's very useful for the for the practice as well to to actually have somebody actively reflecting upon the the, the, the yeah the, the kind of way and the operations that the, the businesses or the context with which architecture is being practiced. Absolutely, and and and, and anecdotally, we you know we know that that practice get a huge amount out of that um, out of that exercise, which is really great. So tell us a little bit about about how the apprenticeship schemes work and how that has been kind of evolved and how that differs from say the the learn pay the, the earners you learn yes yeah, so, so the, the 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 apprenticeship um uh, method is is different from our model in the sense that um you, you have actually less engagement with a kind of um, conventional university-based mm -hmm. learning. There's the apprenticeship levy, which is the mechanism through which industry can um, uh, can uh, uh, pay people enrolled in that uh, in, enrolled in that program. I think there's a huge amount in um, the apprenticeship model uh, and in the, in the in the kind of potential of that apprenticeship model um, and in kind of relevant apprenticeship standards to reflect the kind of coming substantial economic shifts through kind of just, just transition and facing um, the kind of extreme effects of climate emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very much where I see the long-term future of the, of the school being. I suppose, you know, my argument is, and of course, you know, apprenticeship, the whole apprenticeship method the idea of of serving articled pupillage with your brass plate master was the predominant method of architectural education in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century. Uh, you know, your architectural university based architectural education um, was a relative Johnny come lately. The University of Liverpool being the first uh, university uh, architecture department uh, in the country, and then and then the kind of steady growth of university-based education in the first half of the 20th century, climaxing in the Oxford Conference of 1958, which sought to establish architecture, in a sense, as an intellectual discipline, as underpinned by a kind of quasi-scientific uh, method of, of, of research and that effectively you know, killed off 
the remnants of the apprenticeship model. So it's, it's very interesting, you know, if you take a kind of longer historical perspective that we're coming back to all the, the potential advantages of an apprenticeship method. Mm-hmm. That being said, you know, I suppose I'm interested in the possibilities that the apprenticeship model can open up for new and emerging forms of practice that are relevant to the green economy and the green skills shortage. And that's been informing quite a lot of, 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 of the thinking that I've been doing. I, I guess, I guess the, the next question would be, what was, from your perspective, what is the role of, of architectural education? And there's, there's a kind of two ways of looking at this, which kind of relate or overlap onto what you've been saying about the intellectual discipline of architecture and the kind of the business side of architecture or the, the, the practical professional side of architecture. You know, many business owners will look at architectural education and be like, well, surely it's the place where you're pre- being prepared for practice. Whereas there is also the massive advantage of or the, the potential and possibility of you know, being trained with an architectural way of thinking and being able to apply an architectural lens to all sorts of problems that don't necessarily have anything to do with with construction. There's an enormous amount of value in that and there's an enormous amount of career opportunity in that. And actually we're starting to see many people who have been trained in architectural disciplines going off and having wonderful careers in UX design or becoming lead technologists in sportswear companies or car manufacturing or, you know, the, the possibilities are, are, are enormous. And in many times, you know, this, these alternative routes to education, um, to, you know, these alternative pathways after architectural education lead to a lot more financial compensation. So what, what, do you, what do you believe the role of architectural education is and what's the philosophy of the LSA? Yeah, it's a really good, it's a good question, but it's actually, a, it's a big and very complicated one. I mean, the LSA's vision is that people um, should live more fulfilled and more sustainable lives in cities. Mm-hmm. And our mission is to educate future leaders in designing the innovations that um, humanity and the planet will need uh, uh, in the face of these kind of massive existential and ontological um, challenges, namely of, of climate emergency uh, and, the, and the kind of its corollary of, of, of rising um, social uh, and socioeconomic inequity. Um, you know, we have a very clear mission in, 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 in that sense, and um, we want to operate in the kind of real politic, uh, in the real world, producing graduates certainly from our part two program that are that are practice ready, that are industry ready and that can be um, quote unquote productive. But we want always to maintain that um, eye to the future and that more holistic perspective, which is that, you know, um, without caring for humanity and the planet, there will be no economy, there will be no industry, there will be no business, there will be no practice. What is the broader role of architectural education is a good question. What is its function? And and you're right to draw attention to the kind of amazing growing diversity of practice that's diversified even further from when the school started nine years ago. And I think... I've got a couple of thoughts about that. Um, in terms of practice and in and 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 industry, you know, there are, as it were, defined roles that reflect uh, kind of economic, industrial, and contractual conventions and realities. And I think that's the point I, I was trying to make earlier: that the architect, right, the modern architect that emerged in the nineteenth century as the arbiter of a contract between a client socially up here and the contractor, the builder down there in the conception of, of, of the kind of bourgeois middle class mm-hmm. architect is really important to understanding, you know, a lot of the kind of enduring conventions and attitudes, not only in architectural education, but in the kind of broader sense of architectural professionalism and practice. Uh, you know, those industrial, economic, contractual conditions we know are changing. In a sense, the profession has struggled to change with it. It's not just architecture. Profession, the professional ideal struggles, perhaps, 
to, to accommodate that to accommodate that that change. And we can we can come back to that um, uh, in, in in a moment if you like. On on, on the other side, um, there's a bigger question about the nature of technical education and a kind of creative education and the, the wider creative economy and indeed the digital economy. And, and, and on that, I'm increasingly, I think of the view, because it's not just architecture who talks like this, right? That can generate amazing UX designers or, you know, can generate the next Virgil Abloh or, or, or whatever. Sure. Um, lots of disciplines can do that. So why are we not focusing on a system of further and higher education, which teaches you, which is less focused on disciplinary distinction and more on ways of thinking? Mm -hmm. Because we might end up with richer learning experiences in, in, in that way. So why are we still worrying about a degree in art history, a degree in architecture at level six? Yeah, or let's say levels four, five, and six, rather than almost abstracting thematically the kinds of skills and ways of thinking that you need to function in quite a fast-changing and very challenging mm -hmm. um, uh, economy and, and wider environment. Yeah. yeah, that's a moot question. I don't have the answer to that question, um, uh, but I think it's a really, I think it's a really relevant as we figure out, you know, what are the appropriate funding mechanisms for uh, higher education? Um, what about the fact that there's going to be much greater emphasis from government on, on lifelong learning? There already is with the coming uh, uh, lifelong loan entitlement, that, we, that we're going to have, you know, many careers within a, within a lifetime. Indeed, we already are. How can we actually embrace that? rather than holding on to, as I say, particular, particular kind of ways of divvying up um, uh, uh, bits of knowledge into what we call kind of discrete disciplines or, or discourses. Mm -hmm. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded about the, the, the answer to that question, but it is, it is an important one to consider. It is, and I, I, think, it's, I think it's very, very fascinating, you know, because there's, there's a, you know, as you, as you pointed out, the way that, the job market and the economy and commerce is working as it's so fast moving that actually being overly specialized is not the best solution for a, it's not the best return on value, on investment, if you like, for a student. C certainly not at level six. And, and that is why I really applaud what the ARB are doing in their proposed reforms to architectural education and the general direction of travel, which seems to be moving away from accrediting level six, i.e. part one, because it, it can open up that whole world. You know, the school was set up, you know, Will Hunter's idea was the think tank was alternative routes for architecture, ARFA. That's what he announced in the architectural review a decade ago, out of which came the LSA. And you know, it must provide him with a degree of satisfaction that the, that the ARB, no less, are starting to talk about alternative routes for architecture. You know, that the sector of the sense has caught up with that way of thinking. What's exciting, therefore, for us at this juncture is we can go back to that original mission, that original vision, and say, okay, well, let's, let's take a step back and look at this then. What might the alternative routes for, for not just architecture, but for a kind of responsive built environment education to meet the societal and environmental, the urgent societal environment and environmental needs that we have in this, in this particular moment, and that which will continue uh, to evolve over the coming decades. So, so how does the NSA measure its success then? What are, what are the sorts of, you know, in business we have key performance indicators, if you like. What would be some of the, the KPIs of a, of a traditional university and what would be some of the KPIs of, of the LSA? Well, it's employability, uh, it's, it's attainment uh, and, and academic performance in, in endpoint assessment. You know, and we are, we're part of that world, right? You know, we, we are, um, uh, we've, our degrees are awarded by the University of Liverpool. So there's a quality assurance process that we go through with them. We're regulated by the Architects Registration Board and by the Royal Institute of British Architects. You know, we're subject to all of those conventional measures. I suppose our kind of um, 
deeper vision of 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 deeper measure of success is about to what extent you know we're going we are able to reach our vision uh, achieve our vision fulfill our mission that people live more fulfilled uh, and sustainable lives in in cities that's that's much harder i think that's much harder to measure that, that you know we do that qualitatively um you know in the work that we see being produced in what practice and industry tell us which is that they love our graduates and that they that they come out with a degree of kind of maturity of understanding about the the, the kind of realities of contemporary practices as I've, as I've as I've emphasized but 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 I think Rion you 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 happen upon a really important question which is which is another one that kind of exercises me which is that we don't have in architecture and arguably in sort of significant swathes of the built environment an evidence based uh, sort of sector specific industry specific evidence base for um the value of our teaching so yeah as you know architects are wont to compare themselves unfavorably with the medical profession and let's 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 indulge that cliche for a moment um <laughs> things like the objective structure clinical exam in medicine relate you know the way that you teach and the endpoint assessment to improve clinical outcome why don't we do that why don't we have you know we again we're very stuck in a 19th century way of thinking about the portfolio this very rarefied um way of demonstrating your your work which privileges design and then a a, a viva voce certainly in our case in which your communication skills i.e. your ability to persuade a, a client as it were are kind of are kind of tested i'm talking at a sort of you know deeper deeper uh, level where are we testing the kinds of competencies the kinds of behaviors let alone the knowledge and the skill and experience um that we that we see being pulled up hauled up in front of the grenfell inquiry yeah you know so i think that there are we should be innovating and evidencing how pedagogy can lead to better built outcome mm-hmm. now there are the beginnings of those measures contained within post occupancy evaluation you know obviously the organizations like the quality of life foundation are doing amazing work flora samuel's work on the on the sort of social value of um of architecture have you have you talked to flora on this podcast no i haven't you got to get her on your podcast right because i think it's so relevant to to yeah. to um to some of the questions that you're that you're asking and indeed to the business of architecture um uh, uh, we should be doing that much much more so what i would like to see and it won't be immediate at all but you know the lsa does not do research in a kind of conventional university way and all uh, and, and 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 i'm fine with that and i'm actually proud of that despite you know, myself coming from a research background as an academic but where i would like us to gain um research expertise is in the very pedagogy uh, of architecture and evidencing and innovating testing and then evidencing how innovation in pedagogy leads to better uh, uh, built outcome that is in a sense free from the kind of standardized regulatory returns you know which you know, we have a sort of um s- sort of societal need to measure everything all the time and you know higher education is absolutely not free from that uh, i'm talking about something kind of richer and and more qualitative hmm. what do, what do students want what do students want in terms of from their education. being taught yeah from their from their education because i guess it's it's an interesting one with a, a young architectural student you kind of uh, making a commitment in many cases to a profession that you know little about as you enter into it um and the reasons for wanting to study architecture are going to be you know numerous but that but we're often I often wonder what is it that a student wants at the at the end of it do they want opportunities do they want like a a career or like career stability or you know this this point of being able to choose do they want to enjoy study what is it that's and again I always think about I'm always thinking a university like a business so it's kind of understanding like what's the what's the proposition if you like what's the what's the offer 
and what well, I, I, the market I, wants. I think that the, the, the section of the market that's attracted to the LSA wants that connection with practice. Right. Um, you know, has employability absolutely on their mind, but also has a belief in, you know, the prospect of a better world. Um, you know, I, I've been talking a lot about about the kind of radical realism which I I want the school to kind of embrace more deeply. We want people to be able to operate in the real world and to thrive in the real world. We don't want them to lose the kind of radical spirit, the kind of maybe thinking from first principles, in a sense, a kind of playfulness with mm-hmm. often what is quite a dismal reality. Don't forget, you know, my, the, our students on average are age uh, twenty three. They have come into political maturity, you know, f- out of um, first wave of austerity under the coalition through mm-hmm. Brexit, uh, the rise of Trumpianism, um, a, a, a COVID, uh, Black Lives Matter. You know, this is this is a, a sort of battle hardened um, uh, generation. Uh, right. To you know, so I think they're they're worried about their immediate prospects. Yeah. They're living in London, in our case, studying in the midst of a, an energy crisis and a, and a connected cost of living crisis. That's really kind of terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I think they, they want a degree of, um, uh, of, of kind of surety. Um, uh, and as I say, of employability, I think that connection to practice is absolutely what we're about, unremittingly, unrelentingly. Um, uh, and, and I think that really attracts them. But also the sort of independence that we encourage. You know, we don't offer a unit system. Uh, we very much encourage collaborative um, working, but we also are proud of the kind of autonomy of the individual um, uh, in the, um, uh, uh, within our pedagogy. I, I must say, I think that that will change more generally. Again, I think that's another sort of epistemic, um, endemic thing in architecture, that it is about the individual. It's back to that sort of brass plate ideal, um, you know, my name above the door. Mm-hmm. I think that presents some really interesting challenges to the future of architectural education. And what is part zero and part four? So, you know, the LSA, as I say, is coming up to its 10th birthday. We've got our part two. We're immensely proud of our part two. We want, we're, we're committed to it. We want to continue working on it. But quite a lot of change is happening. First of all, as you've alluded to, you've got the kind of rise of the apprenticeship, the apprenticeship model, which, you know, it's not, it's not, as it were, sort of major imminent threat to our model, but it, it, it certainly it starts to compete with it. Uh, we also have the ARB's consultation on proposed reforms of architecture education and significant change happening there. Um, we are operating in a post-Brexit, post-Grenfell world where ideas about standards of entry, uh, of qualification, of professional competency are all changing. Yeah. So for me, the worst thing for the LSA to do, a new school for a new century, uh, would be to mimic conventional architecture schools and you know emerge with a part one, a part two, and a part three. Yeah, it might be a two-year part one, it might be an apprenticeship part two, but basically we're talking about same old, same old. Mm-hmm. And for me, what attracted me to this institution and to this role is that the LSA is a critique as much as an institution. So part zero and part four, in a sense, are, 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 my, are our responses to this very fast changing um, and still emerging landscape of higher education generally and architectural education specifically. So part zero, and, and, and in a sense, they're, they're, they're measures, they're projects to, for us to work on whilst that landscape or whilst our view of that landscape clarifies. So part zero is, is intended as a series of sub-degree interventions. So it's the bit before. Right. And what I see it as is um, pertaining to a common 
uh, educational framework across the built environment, you know, which the Edge Commission have been talking about for over a decade. You know, it's people like Adrian Lehman and Bill Bordes have been talking about, you know, kind of ideal of a of a built environment fellowship. Yeah, it's what, in a sense, uh, the injunctions in Hackett, in Egan, and Latham encourage us to um, to do. We see it as a kind of ladder of opportunity. So it will be a series of interventions from level two, maybe even level one, uh, through to level four, level five. So broadly speaking, from kind of 13 um, to 19, we see it as a bridge between the so-called professions and the so-called trades, referencing kind of the the, the way uh, uh, I was thinking uh, earlier. Um, and it's a framework for industry and practice to to use. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So it's going to be a series of programmes. There'll be a Saturday club as part of the National Saturday Club, which will be for 13 to 16 year olds. That's launching in January. We're trying to get funding for a programme for the EPQ, which is the extended project qualification that amounts to half an A level. Mm-hmm. There are also things called FPQs and HPQs, uh, uh, foundational and higher project qualifications, which are self-driven projects. You don't have to be of school age. It could be a really useful kind of bridge for um, uh, career changes, 120 hours self-directed project. Um, And then a level four, level five qualification. Now, there's a whole range of what that could be. That might be a foundation degree. That might be a higher technical qualification. It might be a higher apprenticeship. We want to take some time to figure that out. What we are absolutely clear on is that all these interventions will be oriented towards the green skills shortage. Um, And I think in the first instance, specifically on the challenge of uh, design-led retrofit and uh, adaption and greater resilience of the built environment, you know, from an infrastructural to to Mm -hmm. domestic um, scale. So as part of that, we want to we want to run a commission um, that will look into three things that will really help shape the then kind of ongoing future of the of the part zero Um, to understand the desirable pathways for the young people from underrepresented and non-traditional backgrounds that we're trying to reach. As you as you ask, you know, what does the market want? What do these young people want Um, and what are the barriers that they're facing? Secondly, how can we develop Uh, kind of sophisticated and nuanced um, uh, uh, means to understand the kind of industrial and economic need at a series of scales, local, regional and national, and how can we respond to that? Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, which comes back to that idea of the kind of framework for practice, how can we leverage uh, social value contributions through public procurement of design and construction services to underpin those programmes so that they are quickly scalable and sustainable because i'm quite concerned that a number of local authorities don't seem to have a kind of um particularly well resolved social value uh, framework mm-hmm. and we're and 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 because there's a kind of commercial impetus for practice um to come up with initiatives around social value relating to esg or edi or whatever it is that um, you're, we're going to end up with a kind of increasingly fragmented picture of lots of internships here, placements there, programs there. And I suppose I'm, I don't want to stop practice from doing that as part of procurement process and, and yeah. demonstrating social value. But find that, you know, their business is to design and produce buildings. You know, our, our business is to think about young people and learning experiences. And can we therefore create something that they can feed into, they can plug into, from which they get a return, but there is genuine social value uplift as part of it. Mm-hmm. So that's what part zero is. It's a, it's a, it's an advocacy Amazing. campaign, and it's a series of targeted interventions through programs. And Amazing. then those things will come come. I mean, come and, and it's quite remarkable as well, like to, to actually start introducing architecture to, you know, much, much younger audience. But as I say, critically, not just architecture, yeah. But but the but the kind of skills and opportunities that are coming. So you know, for me, that as far as I understand it, and I'm, I'm you know very happy to be told otherwise, we don't have a shortage of architects. 
That's not the issue. We may have issues with the, the diversity of the project. There's no shortage of architects. Mm -hmm. What we do have is a shortage of people who can deliver retrofit of 20 million homes. You don't need to take 10 years, as we know is the average length of time for architectural education, in order to get on and start doing that. So if we want to create a sort of um, opportunity for you know, underrepresented or disadvantaged communities, I think actually showing them a path to um, you know, degree of commercial success or at least kind of material comfort mm -hmm. whilst gaining skills that could then be turned into an architectural career, if that's what you wanted to do, then yeah. that's great. So you know, if we then link back to what the ARB are proposing, so if the ARB say, right, well, we're not we're not really worried about part one, accrediting part one anymore. Why could you not do a kind of retrofit apprenticeship or some sort of green skills in construction apprenticeship? And then if it turns out you've got a kind of incredible aptitude for architecture, you can marry um, that sort of business now with an incredible visual and spatial imagination. Then you can, please come and do a level seven, do a part two, do an M arch, and get onto the register within a couple of years using an earn while you learn model or an apprenticeship model. But 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 that's we've got real issues in our wider sectors with capacity and green skills shortage, and we should be higher education and learning institutions should be responding to those with energy and ingenuity. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 if the LSA can't do that. You know, with all that we say about humanity and the planet, with all that we say about access and affordability, then something is going wrong. And yeah. for me, that's a much more exciting and relevant, which is another fundamental thing to the LSA, course of action than simply, um, uh, you know, either side of the part two, setting up a part one and a part three. Amazing. So who are the kind of people that teach at the LSA? people from practice primarily so all our design tutors are in practice of, of 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 varying kinds from 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 small to medium to large uh in fact even our design history team which is led by the um uh amazing alan powers the rest of that team are um architects uh uh, so it's that, that, that's the kind of typical complexion, as it were, of of of, um, of people that we we have. Where we where we can always get stronger is, I think, driving up um, climate literacy uh, amongst our teaching faculty, um, and we can, I think, continue to support them in pushing that kind of radical realism um, or radical realist agenda. Um, but yeah, that's a really. Uh, uh, I think important hmm. part of our kind of faculty development. We don't have a permanent academic faculty that, that the only permanent academics are me um, yeah. and Samantha Harding, our academic director. Where does the role of like specifically, you know, business in terms of entrepreneurship, in terms of finance, in terms of talking about financial literacy, economics, maybe even sales and marketing. Does this rear its head in any kind of part? I mean, th what I like is, you know, what you're saying is if, if, if people are in practice, they're going to get a little flavor of that regardless. Does the LSA or does some of the courses, does that, does it get more pronounced at any point? Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of sales and marketing or communications more broadly, we, you know, we're very, we're very good at that because we put them so much in these kind of pseudo or actual professional environments mm -hmm. um, in terms of kind of the sort of, um, you know, as part of their tectonics modules, they produce effectively a kind of ITT, uh, you know, that, that, that we try to mimic in some of the outputs, those sort of realities of practice. Um, what we've been doing with um, our uh, kind of urban design module design cities is trying to um, get them to engage with different, the kind of mechanics of different modes of development. Right. You know, from kind of um, private uh, led kind of commercial development through to local authority led and sort of, you know, pu pu public sector through to kind of alternative or radical forms of development. And I'm very keen that we almost start to sort of gamify some of those conditions in the generation of the thesis project. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a kind of medium to long term project. We're, we're definitely not, we're not, we're not there fully. But I think that, that, that a lot of what we're trying to do with part four uh, will create the space for um, that kind of greater financial literacy 
and some of the sort of more robust business skills to which you to which you alluded. Mm -hmm. So the, the point of part four is that it will become in time a fairly comprehensive library of post qualification learning experiences, but which uh, sort of modular learning experiences, which our part two students will be able mm -hmm. to have access to. Amazing. So, so we're working at the moment, we're starting with a, a, essentially some kind of mandated essentials. So as you know, a condition of chartered membership for the RIBA um, uh, is going to require a demonstration of some core competencies, starting with health and life safety, including fire safety post Grenfell, then moving on to ethics, climate literacy, and so on. And that there are, um, that, that you're going to have to demonstrate competency to the ARB as well. So, so we're starting with that. We've been working for some months now on a course around fire health and life safety. Um, but then also what we kind of call practice differentiators. So courses that might relate to um, kind of business practice and commercial opportunities. So uh, we're working on a course with the Architectural Heritage Fund um, on the intersection of social and built heritage. The AHF provides um, uh, capital loans and grants to social enterprise who get hold of heritage assets, a significant number outside of London. And for me, that creates sort of really exciting opportunities for, for kind of small and emerging practice to you know, find, to diversify their business um, and learn about, again, different, different models of development, namely in this case, through building preservation trusts and heritage development trusts. So, so more of that will come in as we develop the kind of infrastructure for part four, which will be largely digital and blended. Well, th this um, is very exciting because this also sets up a very natural sense of inquiry for, for students moving into practice to be interested in those sorts of things. And I can see a lot of possibility where students are starting to, you know, get deeply interested into the financial models that potential clients are actually using and aligning their design theses with that agenda. That's enormous value. It's enormous value for the client. And that's where that's where we'll start seeing innovations in, you know, how fees are structured. And actually, you know, when I'm when I'm consulting with with business owners, we're always talking about this idea of, well, you know, the time of where where a RFQ gets issued or a competition is issued and your practice hasn't been involved in that, it's already too late. And what we're looking at here is the potential of of architects being interested in the funding and procurement models of their clients and being able to advise and help structure that. That already creates a, a much better context for a client seeing and perceiving what the value of the architect is and where they can bring, which means that the fees will go up or there's the, yeah. there's the potential to raise fees, if you like. Yeah. I mean, I, we should, we should, we should speak more about this real, because I think, you know, what I'm looking for is people who can help us to start, as I say, to gamify in some, mm -hmm. in a serious way, as it were, um, the kind of simulation of those real life conditions in the generation of the thesis. And, and, and my argument is it doesn't always the theses that, that our students interrogate, therefore don't always have to be these kind of do-goody, you know, te terribly earnest projects as they sometimes are. Mm -hmm. You know, why not understand how the worst and most cynical kind of commercial development happens? And therefore what your options are as an architect, because you won't be able to inhabit that role as Muff have, you know, talked about of the kind of double agent Yes. You know, maintaining your responsibilities to uh, the public and and to kind of civil and civic advancement, whilst also understanding that you're operating within a real politic, uh, within a, within an economy. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in in that and how the how the thesis projects can. I don't think with too much difficulty start to. Um, start to simulate that. What, what, what we're also trying to do is, is, is widen out our practice network to include other kind of key industry partners. So Savills, for instance, have, 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 have joined oh, us. Brilliant. Um, and we would like to get more developers of all kinds. It's not, it's not about privileging a particular form of commercial practice, a particular sure. form of commercial development. You know, we, we are about the real world. If we want mm -hmm. to see change in the real world, we need to understand all the different people who play a part in shaping Absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Very, very exciting to, to, to hear this. This is what, you know, I've been wanting to hear from educators for so long. So it's really magical to, to be hearing this. Um, let's briefly just, um, you've got a new book. 
I have got a new book. Let's let's have quickly touch on touch on this. It's called Designs on Democracy. Fantastic. When's uh, it out? Architecture in the Public and Individual Learning is out now <laughs> in all good bookstores. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, I see my work as a historian very much as contiguous with, you know, what I try to do as an educator and as it were, as an administrator. Mm -hmm. um, the book is about the kind of formation uh, or, or a moment in the formation of the modern architectural profession. So it's about architectural culture more broadly. It spans uh, this sort of extraordinary um, territory of design, of practice, of professionalism, of kind of discourse and representation. It talks about the kind of cultural economic impacts of the great slump in 1929 on the construction industry. It talks about the birth of public relations uh, within the, the building industry and architecture. Uh, it talks about um, uh, heterodox economics and um, particular models of delivering low rise, high density housing campaigns during the 1930s. It's a, it's a weird, uh, and I'm not sure in every case, entirely successful um, analysis of that, of that world. But, but, you know, there are so many echoes of that world, I think, in our own mm. contemporary moment, that it's very much informed the way that I think about the NSA, the way that I think about my own um, teaching practice. I was I was going to ask actually um, about your route into becoming the the the, the director here, and mm. um, you know what's the link between being a, an architectural historian and being an educator? But it, it's very apparent from just talking to you and and the sort of the deep insights, the profound insights of actually looking at the history of the profession and then where this kind of tension has has arisen. Um, but but what what do you think are some of the 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 powerful links between this uh, being a historian and now being an educator? And were the two ever separate? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, was, I was saying this to someone last night. I think there's this extra, the, the figure of the architectural historian in the kind of the architect and architectural student's imagination is such a kind of bogey. <laughs> you are this. You are this sort of bogey man of, oh, my God, here it comes, like the history and theory lectures, the survey, the theoretical stuff that I don't really understand. And, Whereas history, the broader discipline of practice, uh, sorry, of, of history, uh, and indeed the kind of role of the historian in culture, in society is much richer than that. You know, historians do all kinds of things. Historians have a kind of practice. Um, it's, it seems to me particularly acute in architecture that people get terribly het up about the fact that, oh my God, but you're a historian. Ugh. No, historians can think. Uh, they have a way of understanding the world. They have things to say about how we live and how we build. And um, in my case, I am a historian of the built environment and I've been engaged in architectural institutions and architectural discourse for you know, a decade uh, at the RIBA, in architecture schools, uh, through research, uh, in the worlds of heritage, in educational charities. So, so and, and what I love about the NSA is that it, was an extraordinary opportunity, is an extraordinary opportunity because it combines so many of these interests, so many of these perspectives within the sector, you know, all for the better. So I don't see any problem with being a historian, as it were, uh, uh, or, 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 or I feel no surprise that uh, a historian might have something to say. You know, historians yeah. have things to say about politics, about government, about the economy. Why would they not have something to say about architecture <laughs> or, or the production of the built environment? It seems to me, you know, and, and, and I think it comes back to what I say, which is this, this, it's, this it's about design, but you're not mm. a designer. No, I'm not. Uh, no, I'm not a designer. <laughs> That's fine. I, I, and I don't, I don't pretend to be. If I was, if I was running studio, uh, uh, I, might be, I, might be, I might be worried. But there's a lot that one can do. There's a lot that one can see about architecture uh, and the kind of context in which architecture is produced, built environments are produced, which I think um, is valuable and is informed um, by you know, my, the, the, the time that I spent thinking and spend thinking about, about history. Amazing. Brilliant. Well, I think that's the perfect place to conclude the conversation there, Neil. Thank you so much for, for no a profoundly insightful conversation for me personally. So I've really, really enjoyed talking with oh, you. Thank and, you for having me. And it's been an absolutely delight to hear about the LSA. And I've been following what the LSA has been doing for the last, you know, for the last 
decade really and i've always been you know uh uh uh, uh, kind of in the background applauding what you guys are doing so it's a real pleasure look we're Uh, open we're open we want more collaborators always want more collaborators real your listeners you know please get in touch because if the things that we're saying are resonating you know we need those collaborators we need that capacity at the moment we've got great ideas but we need help to deliver them yep love it brilliant Thank you so much, Neil. All right. Cheers, Rio. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.